Well, hello, everybody. My name is Timothy Gager, and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. Uh, tonight, with our usual cast of characters, we have our feature, Mr. Matt Bell, uh, coming at you. And uh, let me uh, do a little bio stuff. And this is for people that are, and I'll only do this for people that were just a little bit too lazy to go to Matt's website and uh, check it out himself. And there's, that's his new book to the left, Appleseed, and their Refuse to be Done is coming out in 2022. And we'll probably be discussing both of those books. Um, and uh, the uh, wonderful bio, just uh, very, very briefly, um, if you guys are really interested, just go to mattbell.com. But his latest Appleseed was published by Custom House in July 2021, very recently. And uh, he's written a slew of books. We're going to talk about some of them, too. And uh, you know, he's coming uh, to us from a uh, location not in Massachusetts, which is something that I love about Zoom <laughs> uh, broadcasts. So without anything from me, uh, let me turn it over to Mr. Matt Bell. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Timothy, and thanks for uh, for having me today. Um, thanks to everybody who's here or is watching on the stream. I really appreciate it. Um, good to see some some friendly faces and people I know. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, just the opening from Appleseed, maybe the first uh, beginning of it. But just for uh, anyone who doesn't know anything about the book, uh, it's a thousand year environmental novel starting in 1799 and ending in the far future. Um, part of it is a that I'm going to read from today is a, um, a mythological retelling of the Johnny Appleseed folk tale, um, as if Johnny Appleseed was a fawn from Greek or Roman myth. Um, so it's half human, half animal, Johnny Appleseed. Um, there's a, a near future uh, kind of late climate change America thread, and then another uh, storyline 700 years. And, and our future takes place in a sort of glacial uh, North America uh, in a new ice age. But you don't need to know all that for tonight. So I'm just going to read uh, the first uh, couple of pages of um, the 1799 timeline, which is about a character named Chapman, who is our uh, half human, half animal, uh, Johnny Appleseed as Fawn character, and his brother Nathaniel. Um, as they're arriving in Ohio from Pennsylvania, uh, to start another season of apple planting in the frontier. Okay. Chapman wakes in the cold and the dark and the wet pre-dawn slush to the sound of his brother Nathaniel, already up and tending to the sputtering ashes of last night's fire, cursing and shivering, huddled beneath his only blanket. Despite Nathaniel's ministrations, the coals beneath the ashes stay dead, the gathered wood wet, breakfast impossible. Shelling himself out from his bedroll, Chapman rises to offering his brother a grunted good morning for stamping his cloven hooves against the frigid ground, trying to quicken blood sluggish with sleep. As first light breaks, he stalks silently away from their campsite, climbing the last ridge line of this Pennsylvanian mountain pass to watch the night's rainfall trickle off into morning mist, admiring the fine accidental melody of clean water falling branch to branch. A moment later, dutiful Nathaniel follows along, dragging their bags and tools to where Chapman waits upon his outcropping of rock, one clawed hand raised to shield his golden eyes as he surveys the forest across today, snowpack still jamming the forest shadows, sparkling ice coating its swampy glacial kettles and its irregular lakes, all this waiting beauty backlit now by the red shroud of sunrise, the new day's dawn setting a glow, a vast world not yet fully explored. This brother, Nathaniel says, placing one calloused hand on taller Chapman's bare brown shoulder, waving the other out over the territory below, this is where we'll make our fortune. Pointing out the first landmarks they're due to pass today, he traces a path out of this mountain gap and down to the slim strand of tilled earth that gives entrance to the Ohio territory, then the way beyond into the unsettled, unmapped forest swamps of the interior, past the river bottomlands and sheltered ravines where they sowed last year's nurseries toward the next uninhabited acres where they'll aim to plant this year's seeds. As Nathaniel happily details his plan, Chapman smiles his much practiced smile, his sharp teeth slipping from behind his broad lips. Look, brother, he interrupts, pointing out dim campfires barely visible through the morning mist 
flickers of flame and smoke rising in far off shelter dales. There are so many more of us this year. Every year, these fires move deeper into the landscape, each one a distant sign of strangers come to expand the human mark to put the land to what Nathaniel has taught Chapman are its rightful uses. Here are settlers hunting and trapping and gathering wild foodstuffs, cutting down trees and tearing up rocks to make room for placeholder farms, making way for the towns to come. While others tap trees for sap and hang tin sugaring buckets over hot coals, Sometimes passing the time with amateur fiddling, the inviting sounds of their instruments carrying across to even the most desolate, starless, moonless nights. Together, the brothers measure again the increasingly believable potential of this territory, its wilderness cleared by war, then emptied by treaty. As he has at the start of every other year's journey, Nathaniel tells Chapman again how this taken land can now be brought to heal by industrious men, how by many hands, the foundations of a new civilization will be laid here. The land year by year made ready for the coming of more people until one day the uncultivated earth gives way to what Nathaniel says will surely be the greatest of cities, each graced by the tallest buildings and the widest avenues, all populated by an endless parade of hardy settlers planting horizon busting fields of wind tilted golden grain, harvesting fruitful orchards planted by these two forward thinking brothers. Chapman and Nathaniel and these others gathered around their distant fires are only the first to come, he says. Even if our industries should fail entirely, Nathaniel concludes, surely we will not be the last. Nathaniel has said this for 10 years now, the same lines recited in the same mountain pass at the outset of each year's venture. It's time to go, Chapman says, suddenly impatient with his brother's story. He ties his bedroll and his tools over one bare shoulder, slings his leathern seed bag around the other. The morning air is chilled and damp, but the bark of his skin keeps him warm enough that even in winter he wears no shirt or coat, only a pair of trousers hacked off above his inhuman knees. He dusts the last of the night's frost from his flanks, then whinnies lowly, stretching tall to rub the smooth shells of his curved horns with his clawed hands. First his broken horn, and then his intact twin, for luck. Nathaniel laughs, then mimics his brother's superstition, rubbing his own bare temples, where just recently a few gray hairs started creeping through the brown. Meet you at the river, Nathaniel teases, sidestepping onto the narrow trace path leading down the ridgeline, if you can catch me. He rushes to build a slim head start, but his advantage doesn't last long. A moment later, Chapman surges past him, to drop down the steep plunge of the mountainside, his hooves sliding precariously and loose scree as he picks up speed, the joy of moving fast, filling him from the inside out, his fur standing on end, his heart leaping with happy effort. He quickens his pace with every step until a barking cry rips free of him, the sound of his voice foreign enough to this territory and every other to frighten all the nearby roosting birds into sudden startled flight, the gray sky, filling with their black silhouettes, their many cries during the whooping of this one fawn returned at last to wildest lands. As many years as Chapman's made this passage out of Pennsylvania, the thrill of arriving in the territory has never ceased to provoke his fullest wonder. Propelled by joy, he runs dangerously this morning, his furred legs taking leaping, straining steps, his splayed hooves seeking purchase on sharp juttings of quivering rock, on old growth roots thrust through black earth and slushy snow, other obstacles threatening to trip him and send him sprawling. When his descent smooths onto more level ground, he increases his speed again, his few possessions banging rhythmically against his muscular torso as all around him the forest deepens. The sun has only a pale power beneath these trees, where the frontier's every shaded feature is a fresh barrier to progress. Searching for the way forward, Chapman follows a trail trampled by first peoples or fur trappers or single file processions of deer, the path of barely visible scrawl plodding the way forward, then crosses dry strands of seasonal creeks strewn with the lacy bones of trout, an unremembered stream quickening with snowmelt. He encounters a thicket impassable except by hacking out each halting step with his tomahawk. 
He leaps fallen columns of oak and maple, vaults lichen stung trunks, maybe giving shelter to squirming snakes, the only animals he can't abide. His movements scatter squirrels and chipmunks playing amid rotted leaves, forest mice leaping hungrily over melting snow. Once an explosion of foxes appears, a half dozen pups running through the flattened grass of a meadow, once purpled with loose strife, yellowed with goldenrod. In the moist underbrush, he spies this year's first warty toads hopping hungrily through the moldings of mud rattlers and the pellets of horned owls. Abundance everywhere, everywhere gathering and joy and predation and sorrow. Amid all this untamed splendor, every acre of forest is an empire in the shape of the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, what a tremendous section. And we'll talk slightly about that section, but let's talk about apple seed in, in general. Um, according to uh, the According to what I've read up about it, it explores climate change, manifest destiny, humanity's unrelenting exploitation of natural resources. Um, so within a book such as this, how do you juggle that? Did you have all that predetermined or is that just something that kind of weaved its way in? Yeah, not predetermined, but, you know, I think I... Um... I, I'm not a big planner of first drafts. Like first drafts are really exploratory for me. Um, I really started with the idea of writing this like Johnny Appleseed retelling. So it started from that in a, in a more narrow way. Um, but really, as soon as I started writing um, about uh, the colonization of the Midwest and the sort of uh, transformation of the wilderness into, you know, what it is now, um, it started spreading through time, you know, those, those sort of issues aren't located like just in one place or one time, they're sort of spread, um, you know, the, our present is connected to that history really directly. And so trying to find a way to have the book be sort of a, a little more expansive was part of that. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons the book grew in time was because I realized that people in 1799 couldn't have our kind of environmentalism. Um, like, uh, like Thomas Jefferson famously like didn't believe in extinction. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of not, a, he was searching for like woolly mammoths in, in North America because he was sure they must exist because nothing that God created could have vanished from the earth, you know. Um, and so like in some ways to even like write that period correctly, it needed like the correctives of like other times. Um, and so it started to sort of grow in that way. Um, but yeah, it took a long time to figure out. Like, I mean, I think I figured out the last parts of the present, the near present storyline, like two years in, right? Um, so a messy process. So when you were going through the process, did you find it easier to write about like 200, 250 years ago or when it reaches the present or the future, which is sounds downright apocalyptic? Like which yeah. was the easiest <laughs> section the, to the, go about? <laughs> I think the, um, the near future timeline was the hardest to, to sort of figure out logistically in part because um, if you know if you're writing a couple hundred years in the past, you're writing 700 years in the future, you can make up a lot of it without the reader sort of, you know, um, calling bullshit on it. You know, I think um, uh, there, you know, I did historical research for the past, but once you make someone a, a half human, half animal character, like you can throw out certain things, you know. Um, but getting the cause and effect of how we got from like our time to mine's like 50 years in the future or 70 years in the future. Um, that had to be like plausible right uh and so i think that was a little trickier to sort of get right um but really in some ways some of the most interesting world building right like trying to think of a plausible climate future and, and plot it out was um was also really intriguing well as our plausible climate future is happening right in front of us does it make you angry with what's going on with our climate and how people tend to kind of be laissez-faire about it or yeah, I mean, of course, you know, I think we all feel angry at, at I mean, I guess I feel angry a lot about it, um, but I think um, it's tricky to, to have it, uh, I understand why people aren't engaged with it like every second of every day. I get why that would be impossible also to expect everyone to do, um, especially because it's easy to feel sort of powerless in the face of it. You know, I think um, maybe more than most climate change books, like my novel is a little bit about people like trying to do something about the conditions they're in in a really direct big way. Like part of the, the plot of the book is about stopping a company from geoengineering the stratosphere. Like there's like this very big sort of like trying to save the world to protect the world plot. Um, but I, I, that's not what most of us are gonna do or have a chance to do, you know? I mean, I think it's easy to sort of feel powerless. Um, 
I think what, what ended up being the hopeful way to approach the subject for me is that in each of the three storylines, the, the protagonists are like people who are trying to make the world better, the world they live in better, but in the ways that they understand it in their time, you know, and uh, we might make different choices in those same places, but I thought following people who are trying with their own limited knowledge to do the best they could was at least one way of modeling uh, hope in the world. Now, when you write a book that takes place in a span of 250, 300 years, is the story, are the storylines connected in, uh, based on like lineage or? Uh... Yeah, there are, there are connections between the timelines, which are, you know, uh, maybe part of the plot of the book. And so a little spoilery to talk too much about, but I think um, there was one version of the book uh, that is, is not the version it is now, where I thought it was gonna be like a, a single like consciousness for like a thousand years. Um, and it was a very different book in that way. And these are, they're a little more like distinct, although they do have connections between them. Now, when you have the sections, do you jump back and forth within the sections? Are they distinct parts or do they, or do you just kind of slowly go through the whole span right. of the universe there? Uh, no, they're braided. So you're mostly going back and forth between the three. Um, in the early part of the book, it's real like one, two, three, one, two, three, but that complicates later. Your uh, book, I've also noticed, has been described by some very prominent writers as falling to the science fiction realm. Do you sure. consider it? Do you consider that as such? Yeah, I'm fine with that. You know, I, I I feel very like genre agnostic as a writer. You know, like I'm I'm happy to have it categorized however it's useful to people. Um, but I a lot of the influences on the book were science fiction, and and I certainly think of what I was doing in this that way um, when I was selling the book. Uh, I had a conversation with an editor who was like, this isn't like your literary fiction at all. You've really written this like science fiction novel. And I was like, great. And then I had the next conversation. The editor was like, this is a literary fiction novel. This isn't science fiction at all. And I was like, great. You know, like it doesn't matter that much to me uh, how people categorize it. But, you know, like I, I think the biggest influence on it was Ursula Le Guin. You know, like I absolutely think mm -hmm. of it as in, in that sort of lineage of, um, of science fiction and speculative work. So, yeah, I'm very happy to have it called a science fiction novel, that's fine. And what you read tonight was very dense and very poetic. And I'm wondering, uh, do you uh, write in that genre at all? Or because it just, it just seemed to me like it would come very naturally to you. In like, in poetry? Yes. Oh, uh, no, I've written a little bit of poetry, uh, but I'm, I'm not, I do read a lot of poetry, but um, but yeah, the sound of language matters to me a lot, right? Like I, I do read my work aloud a lot and I um, am very, I think to not play with the music of the language would be to give up like half the effect you could be having. Like, I think it's, you, you want to affect the person, the level of music and the level of sense if you can. Well, here's, here's a softball for you. So you read a lot of poetry. You tend to read a lot of books. So uh, in 2020, you read a phenomenal amount of books. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, you read 366 books in 2020. Mm. Now that's a book a day. Um, how do you do that and manage to write and also manage to eat or sleep? Sure. I, I didn't read a 366 books. I read 366 uh, short stories. I read a short story every day last year. So that's that list. Um, I did read like 65 or 70 books um, on top of that. Um, I try to read about 100 books a year and I and more years than not, I, I sort of get that. Um, I mean, part of it's just I like to read, right? Like I read a lot because it's what I want to be doing. Um, I do listen to a lot of audiobooks. I when I run, I, you know, I run, you know, four or five days a week. And so I'm always listening to something there. So it's just squeezing in an extra hour of reading every day by listening to it. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor to teach creative writing. And so I'm all, always reading stuff for class and that too. But, um, but yeah, there's no reason to pretend I don't spend like a lot of my time reading, you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, but that's what I want to be doing with it. So it's, it's not so much as like, how do I get this task done as like, it's a nice way to spend my time. So uh, your quote is, you believe that writers are made from books. Hmm. So say that there's a writer out there that might read a couple of books a year, um, but writes all the time. Um, and how would you advise them? What would you advise them in terms of a reading regimen if they decided to be like, hmm. look, you know, Matt's right. I need to I need to read more. You know, I I, um, oh, I hate to assign anybody a regimen, right? But like, you should do what they want. But I <laughs> sound very um, military there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I do think, um, I think the people, the writers I know who seem the most unique or seem the most sort of like they like they come out of nowhere. Uh, if I get to know them, they inevitably turn out to be like really 
voracious readers and broad readers. They're reading uh, big presses and small, they're reading experimental fiction and, you know, like more traditional things, they're reading books in translation, um, they're reading, you know, across time and across genre. And I think uh, what I've learned for me is like, uh, I'm not someone who's like trying to avoid being influenced. I'm trying to be like, I crave influence. We want to be influenced like as broadly as possible, as widely as possible. Um, and that that actually is, is uh, um, it both helps you, I mean, it's both enjoyable and then it helps you find so, so, uh, unexpected solutions because the solutions, you know, to a science fiction novel might be coming from a translated realist novel published 40 years ago or something, right? You know, like it allows you to sort of draw on other kinds of work. Um, but I, I really think you have to read what you want. I think uh, when people struggle with reading, I wonder sometimes if, if they're doing too much like obligatory reading, they're reading the things they think they're supposed to read instead of the things they want to read. Um, and that's really easy to do, especially if you're on like writer social media and you see like, oh, these are all the books everybody's talking about. You're like, I better read those books. And you're like, me, I don't like those books. Um, and uh, you gotta read like what you want to be reading. And uh, so John from the crowd here asked, what authors do you like? And let's be specific here. Who are you, who's your go-to authors? Like when you just know that like this is an automatic and who have you discovered in the past year that just really knocked you your socks yeah. off? Um, you know, uh, like, you know, the people I sort of started out reading in contemporary fiction in my 20s, like, uh, like Dennis Johnson, um, Amy Hempel and, and Christian Scott and people like that are still like some of my go-tos. Uh, Cora McCarthy, DeLillo, Toni Morrison, and Carson uh, Le Guin. Um, those last five are all people I, I, I said no regimens, right? But one regimen I sometimes give myself is that I'll try to read someone's whole body of work in a year. And so like McCarthy, Morrison, DeLillo, uh, Le Guin, and um, who was the other person I said there? One of those five, I tried to read all of their books in a, a year. And those people end up being like in your bones, right? Like you can just like draw on them anytime. Um, it, last year, God, there's so much good work. Uh, you know, I just read uh, a novel by a Chinese writer named Yan Gi called The Strange Beast, called Strange Beasts of China. That's like maybe my favorite thing I've read in a while. Really strange, sort of speculative uh, book set in a fictional city in China. Um, Excuse me, I've been really excited about that. Um, I feel like, what are my books behind me? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Stephen Graham Jones's uh, The Only Good Indians was one of my favorite books of the last couple of years, a book I feel like I've been evangelizing for since it came out. I just love that book. Um, and uh, another favorite writer, you know, Amy Bender, her new novel that came out last year, I just like deeply love. You know, I think Bender's one of those people that like, uh, like so many people have been influenced by Bender. And like, it's hard to, I think it's hard to write new work when you're influencing everybody else. Like it's this sort of, there's like a lot of work in your vein in the world suddenly. And I feel like um, uh, Bender did something new with this. Like she found like a new zone inside her thing. That's really exciting. That felt like something new. It's great. Um, but you know, tons of stuff. Always reading something new. Yeah. I love that you can just turn around and grab a book and be like, oh, there's this one, there's that it's one. It's really easy to do this stuff from your house, right? You know, like when we were teaching on Zoom, students would ask a question and be like, wait, the book's right there. I'll go get it. You know, it's sort of like a weirdly um, dynamic place to sort of work from in this way. I mean, I'd love to leave my house again, but, uh, but you know, in the meantime. Do you run out of bookshelves? Do you have like, are your stairs bookshelves as well? Because uh, we don't have stairs in our house. I'm losing all that bookshelf space. But uh, yeah, the bookshelves are, <laughs> are gross. And um, uh, and a lot of things that are like, um, uh, I've started stacking them on the bookshelves, like laying them flat and stacking them because I can't get them all in vertically anymore. Um, and then I also have a campus office where I use as like also another gross book storage. So <laughs> I'm trying to give more of them away. I used to have like a lot more books than I have now, but it's still like they're, they're everywhere. Um, that's okay. Books are good decoration as well as uh, useful to read. So John asked a question, which is great because I wanted to move into talking about uh, Refuse to be Done, your book about how to write and revise a novel in three drafts. So John asks, um, uh, I'm getting through all this stuff. John says, I can't ever see myself doing a craft book. It feels prescriptive and dictatic to me. Mm. Um, and he, so basically talk about how you saw your way clear to such a text. Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, hopefully it won't be prescriptive and didactic, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I hope that's not what it is. I mean, I think part of it is like being really clear from the beginning that 
you know, whatever I'm talking about is like an approach, not the approach, right? You know, like that, I think I, I neither teach nor write from a like, there's only one way to do things. I think that's part of it. Um, you know, the, the book really emerged from, uh, from a lecture I used to give, oh, I still give, I guess, but I had my, my traveling show, like a lot of, you end up as a writer with like your craft talk, you go and give places. And for a while, mine was this talk on revision um, and rewriting. Uh, and it's very practical, like not a theory of revision, but like here are like nuts and bolts, things you can do and just like tons of them. Um, and it would go over really well in part because most of us uh, who come up through a creative writing education were required to revise but rarely like taught to revise, you know, sort of in a, in a really specific way. Um, so I hope it's a really practical book. Um, it's really meant to be, here are some things to try, here are some things to do, here are some things that work for me and work for other people. Um, and so I hope people will find it to be that when they read it. Um, and certainly like it, nothing in there is like, if it doesn't work for somebody, it doesn't work for them. Um, but it is a lot of stuff that, you know, I teach novel writing classes. I've obviously written a handful of novels myself. Like it's things I use, in my own process and that I've seen work for other people. Um, and I also kind of think like if it doesn't work, like I learned a lot of what I learned in school, I learned by opposition too, right? Sometimes someone tells you to try something and you're like, well, that doesn't work, but the opposite thing works or pushing against your advice works. Um, and I think there's more than one way the book can hopefully be useful. Um, yeah, do you yeah, have your imposter syndrome goes way up and you're like, oh, I'm also gonna tell you how to write now. And you're like, great. You know? <laughs> Is there for you a number one rule for, I mean, it's, it's, the book's also about writing yeah. besides revising. Is there a number one rule on getting it done or a number one rule for you? Does that exist? No, I don't know what the number one rule is. You know, the, I mean, I think my number one revision rule is like, uh, when in doubt, rewrite, don't revise. Like it's easier to make like a new version of a scene than to make like a bad scene good. Um, so I think I do a lot of like, I'm faster and faster all the time to like scrap and try again. Um, taking what I learned on the first try and, and just doing it from scratch. Um, as far as like writing in general, I just feel like I'm trying to follow my, my excitement and my joy and my playfulness. And like, that's what makes it like fun to, to be at the desk. It makes it like worth being there. Um, I think uh, it's again, that like thing about obligation. Like as soon as you start writing what you think you're supposed to be writing, you're, you're stuck or I'm stuck, you know, like I really, really have to sort of, um, uh, privilege my own sort of interests at the desk. And that seems to get a lot of work done. Um, a lot of my books sound like really bad ideas. I mean, maybe they're bad, they are bad ideas, but they sound like bad ideas. Like I'm going to write a retelling of Johnny Appleseed as if there's a Greek font. If I told my agent that, I'd be like, don't do that. Like, you know, <laughs> that's going to take me five years. Right. You know, it's like, and I feel like all of my books, like if you describe them on day one, it would be like, please don't spend your time on that. Um, and I think it's just like privileging your own interests is part of it. Now, uh, what's the difference in you as a writer from, you know, your first book came out in 2009, it was a book of short fiction, and today, and uh, is any of that process from 2009 to today included in this book, Refuse to Be Done? Yeah, probably. I think, you know, um, I, I, my first novel came out in, in 2013 after a couple of collections, and, um, and when I wrote maybe the first draft of it in 2010 or 2011, and I got done with that first draft and I, you know, it's 300 pages long and I I'd worked really hard on it and I was like uh, happy and also just kind of depressed about it. I was like, clearly had not written a book. Like I'd written something that was book size, you know? And I was like, what am I going to do with this? You know, I feel like that the process that I was doing 10 years ago to learn how to revise my first novel is the seed of this book, right? It's sort of the, the, the first tactics I learned about revision and were things I, I desperately needed for myself. Um, at the short story length, I was able to just like brute force revise, right? If I just did it enough, it would turn out. Um, but that did not seem like a sensible way to approach something novel length and wasn't. Um, so some of those er, 10 years ago tactics are, are, you know, still things I'm doing today. All right, let's close this out with a question from DeWitt Henry. And he wrote, uh, I love the rhythm and syntax of what you read. And uh, someone just, all right, there we go. I'm reading and then the thing just jumped. Um, Faulknerian with the long mm -hmm. gymnastic sentences modulated with shorter, just wonderful uh, questions uh, about apple seed and with the quasi biblical epic feel. Were you thinking of the Garden of Eden? We don't usually think of that myth from an environmental doom point of view. Yeah, thanks to it. Um, uh, thank you for the compliment and the question. Uh, yeah, there is a, if I'd read, 
like two more pages, you would have been sure I was thinking of a Garden of Eden thing. Um, part of what Chapman is doing in his storyline is, um, so there's this, every once in a while you find like a, the metaphor in the research, but um, uh, it's possible not to think of apple trees without thinking of the Garden of Eden. And then uh, uh, apple trees don't grow true from seed. So like, uh, you know, we use grafting when we make like lying, like a honeycrisp apple is a grafted apple. Um, so like there's, uh, it's probably more complicated this, but like in theory, any apple seed could grow up to be any apple. Like there, it's sort of like the infinite possibility of every apple seed. And one of the things Chapman is trying to do is like grow the tree that was in the Garden of Eden or, or a story that he's telling himself about the Garden of Eden. And so if he just plants enough apple trees, if he just converts enough of the earth to apple trees, he'll find this thing he's looking for. Um, and so that's part of his quest. His brother's trying to make money. He's trying to do this like sort of uh, quasi spiritual quest. So it's funny, you know, I, I, I'm a former very devout Catholic and, uh, and people pick up on, certain people pick up on the Catholicism of my work, like with five seconds after hearing it. You know I mean? like, <laughs> there's always somebody who's like, so that was obviously this. I'm like, right, right, right. You know, um, so yeah, I think, uh, thank you to it for being that person today. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you for being here and reading for us and, and uh, really eloquently answering some questions. Um, so uh, I think, Everybody around should uh, definitely check out um, Appleseed, which Matt Bell read from tonight. And uh, in terms of writing your next novel, Refuse to be Done, How to Write and Rewrite a Novel in Three Drafts. And that's coming out in 2022. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, that's wonderful. And now we were going to say goodbye to our streaming folks on Facebook. Um, if you guys want to be in the open mic, use the link right now and you can do that. And, uh, and also next week, if you want to be around for the questions, please log into the Zoom. But I also appreciate you just watching and hanging out. So thanks very much. Thanks, Timmy. Thanks, everyone.